Now, probably this will relate, I think, to everybody, particularly if you're a parent. But even if you're not a parent, you've been a child, and some of you still are children. And you know that when you make something as a child, if you're a little boy, little girl, and, and you've made something, and, and you take it to your parent, you take it to an adult, a teacher, or something like that, and you say, look, Mom, look what I made. Well, the parent looks at the thing, and they kind of examine it, and they take a look at it, and what, inevitably, if you're a parent, what do they say? Oh, you know, Joni, that was so beautiful. Thank you for that. Now, if you don't say that, Probably you need a little help in your parenting skills if you, you know, sort of look at it and go, you know, that really wasn't your best effort. Why don't you try that again? <laughs> but most of us who have a heart, most of us say, that was really beautiful. Thank you for that. Now, as we grow a little older, unless you are a particularly skilled artisan or craftsman, you know, your wife for her 25th Anniversary, 25th year anniversary doesn't want, you know, a little uh, uh, holder for pencils that you crafted out of pottery, does she? She wants something more significant. And even though, like, when our kids are younger, we go, oh, you know, the gift that was made was better than the gift purchased. That has a pretty narrow shelf life because, frankly, we want stuff that somebody bought for us, don't we? Unless, of course, you're really good at what you make, and then that's a different story. But... Um, the point of it is, is this. When we're little and we're cute and we, we show our mommies and our daddies things that we made, they love it. They really, really love it. When we do it as adults, it sort of loses some of its cuteness. And this is particularly true when it comes to faith. When we, when we as people of faith sort of make God in our own image and we make our worship and our, our faith and everything in our own image and we show it to God, God is not nearly as, pressed, as impressed as maybe your mom and your dad were when you were a little kid. And we're going to look at this today. This is the heart of Stephen's argument. We've been looking at uh, the, the martyrdom of Stephen. He was the first Christian martyr. And the indictment that he's bringing to, the, to the, uh, the leaders, the Jewish leaders, is that they've invented this religion. They've, they've taken the things that God told them, and they sort of twisted it and conformed it, and they, they sort of crafted their own their own religion and God is deeply offended he's deeply offended then the story we're going to look at happened 2,000 years ago and he's deeply offended when we do it now it's one of those sermons that we need to look at with with real scrutiny and we need to look at with with real sincerity because we need to be sure that we're worshiping God the way Jesus said we are to worship him in spirit and in truth anything less than that is idolatry and that's what we're going to look at today so let's pray and, and ask for the presence and the power of God to be uh, amidst us. Lord, I thank you for all that you do for us. I thank you for um, the, the power of your word. I thank you that, that when we come into these, these uh, moments of worship and we invoke your name and we, we declare truth, Lord, that, you, that extraordinary things happen and you make us more and more like you and transform us more and more into your image. We ask that you would do that today. Teach us your word. Teach us by your spirit. Teach us to be all that we've been made and called to be as men and women of faith. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, the, almost the entirety of it deals with this, uh, this defense of Stephen. And just to kind of remind us um, of what's happening, Stephen was, was uh, one of those guys that was selected by the apostles to care for the widows in the city of Jerusalem. So he's been working with these Hellenized widows, these, these uh, widows that were influenced by Greek culture. And he's helping them, but it's these very same people that, that have accused him of a terrible thing. They've accused him of speaking against the law of Moses, speaking against the temple, something that in that culture would carry a death penalty. So they've accused him of this. They've brought him before the Sanhedrin. This is the highest Jewish court, and they've accused him of doing these things, and he's, he's bringing his defense. And it's an unusual defense. In the defense, he's going to go all the way back to the very beginning, and he's not just sort of tracking the history of Israel. He's, he's following a very definite 
train of thought that deals with all of the redemptive history, the redemptive purpose of Israel. And what I mean by that, it's how God used the, the nation of Israel and promised them that through them, all of the nations of the earth would be blessed. And of course, these are promises that, that, that we believe as Christians point to Messiah. So he starts with, uh, a promise made to Abraham, who was the father of the nation. And it was to Abraham that the promise was given that through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, to kind of get your timelines right, the story that we're looking happens during the time of Jesus, which is 2,000 years ago. But Stephen is going to go back 2,000 more years to the time of Abraham. So this is now 4,000 years from the, the place that we are in history. So he's going to go all the way back to Abraham, and he's going to say, it was through Abraham that this great promise of redemption was given. Then the, then the promise goes from Abraham to his son Isaac, to Isaac's son Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons, and, it's, and, and his, his his, uh, his son Joseph was was raised up as a deliverer. Joseph was was uh, betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery. He spends 13 years in Egypt, and then he's raised to great prominence, great power to become the second the second most powerful man in the land. And he delivers his brothers and their families out of the famine that was happening in Canaan. And that's how the people of Israel came to Egypt. So they're in Egypt now, um, and and the first 200 years or so they have great prosperity they're growing they're 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 growing in wealth as their cattle and they're, and they're having lots of little babies but a new pharaoh comes to town and he doesn't know this this uh the history and he puts them in bondage so they spend the next couple of hundred years in bondage in slavery but they still begin to grow and god raises up Moses to deliver them out of Egypt. So this is now about 1,500 years from the story that we're looking at, or 3,500 years from the time that we are right now. Moses delivers the people out of, out of, uh, out of, out of Egypt, and, and Stephen, as he's going through this speech, is saying Moses was a great deliverer. So we see that all of these stories have something to do with the deliverance and the redemption of his people. And now it's going to start to take a little bit of a shift. It's going to, we're, if, you, if you like to watch, you know, Law and Order or, or kind of these, these shows that have this kind of, where, the, where, the, where the, the defendant starts to really zero in on his case, this is what Stephen is doing. So let's pick up the story here. With uh, in Acts 7 and verse number 37, after saying that this was the man, in 37 it says, This is that man who told the Israelites, God will send you a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the desert with the angel who spoke to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers, and he received the living word to pass to us. So he's saying, like this, he's saying, This was Moses who went to the hill. If you remember, we studied this a few months ago. Moses went up to Mount Sinai right after they, he delivered the people out of Egypt. He goes up to the mountain and he's going to receive the word of God. Uh, uh, Stephen is saying he receives it from an angel. And, and so this is the divine word. He's up there for 40 days. But in 39, we, we see how this takes this little turn. He says, but our fathers refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. You remember now, Aaron was the brother of Moses. And it's really interesting because Aaron is the guy that brought a lot of this on to the people, all of the idolatry onto the people of Israel. And if you remember the story as Moses was standing before the burning bush before God, he's, he's kind of fumbling and he's, he's kind of resisting God. God is saying, I want you to be the great deliverer of my people. But Moses is saying, well, I don't talk so good. You better send my brother. And he keeps pushing God, keeps pushing God, keeps pushing God, until finally God acquiesces and God says, okay, I'll send your brother Aaron. But that turned out to be, even though God honored Aaron, it was Aaron that brought all of this onto the people. I could preach a whole message just on that. When God sends you, don't argue with God. Don't try to add to his plan. Moses tried to add to his plan, and even though God gave him what he wanted, it wasn't the best for Moses, and it wasn't best, the best for the people. When we add to God's plans, it usually has pretty disastrous results. Moses, uh, they, they told Aaron, make us gods that will go before us as this fellow Moses who has led us out of Egypt. We don't know what has happened to him. Now what they're doing is they're going back to this, this part of their ancient history where Moses has gone up to the mountain and the people were saying, he, you know, he's up there for 40 days. They're saying, we don't, whatever happened to this guy? 
There's all these things that are happening. We haven't heard from Moses. We want to, Aaron, Aaron is the high priest, and they say to Aaron, make us these gods. Make us some gods that will then lead us into our future. And so you remember the story. Aaron shapes this golden calf, which would be representative of all of the gods of Egypt that they would have worshipped back in captivity. Make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and held a celebration in honor of what their hands had made. But God turned away and gave them over to the worship of the heavenly bodies. So God, and if you remember, when Moses comes, God is up there with, with Moses, and God tells Moses, says, hey, these people are, are committing great idolatry down at the bottom of the, of the mountain. You need to go down and take care of this. And so he goes down and takes care of it. And thousands of people lose their lives because of the idolatry. But it's even more than that. Stephen is going to make the case based on this uh, a passage he's going to quote that this idolatry that, be- that began at the very beginning, the early formation of the nation, is going to carry with them all the way to their destruction. Note what he says here. He says, but God turned away and gave them over to the worship of the heavenly bodies. This agrees with what is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring bring me sacrifices and offerings? Forty years in in the desert, O house of Israel, you have lifted up the shrine of Molech and the star of your god, Rephan, the idols you made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. So here's what he's saying, and this is very interesting. What he's saying is the idolatry that began at the very beginning, the earliest formation of this nation, carried with it all the way into the destruction that they experienced uh, at, in Babylon. And if you remember the history, during Moses' period, Moses forms this nation. It goes on for about 500 more years until it's raised up through King David and King Solomon. They carry on for another two or 300 years. And then the, the northern kingdom is carried into captivity by Assyria. And then about 150 or so years after that, the southern kingdom is carried into captivity by the Babylonians. So, so what, what he does, he sort of takes this this, uh, this, this nearly a thousand years of history, and he said it was because of all of that idolatry that began at the very beginning, that's what inevitably resulted in your captivity being carried away into, into captivity in Babylon. And, and this agrees with what Amos, who was a great prophet that wrote several hundred years after this story, Amos would have written about the time when the nation of Israel was carried away, and Amos is saying, this is why. It's because of the idolatry that began at the very beginning. He's going to continue. Now, now the train of thought is going to switch a little bit from people to the tabernacle. So in other words, the plan of redemption begins with Abraham, carries on with Joseph, carries on through the person and the work of Moses. And now it's going to begin to shift a little bit to the the central artifact of of their worship, which was the tabernacle, and then would become the temple. Our, far, our forefathers had the tabernacle of testimony with them in the desert. That's the tabernacle that we studied when we went through Leviticus, and God gave them precise and specific instructions of how to build this tabernacle. The tabernacle was a great, ornate tent that they would, they would fold up and carry with them, and then when they camped, they would, they would take this great tent out, and they would set it all up, and it was there that all the sacrifices would be performed. It had been made to God as, uh, made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. Having received the tabernacle, our, father, our fathers under Joshua brought it with him. Joshua was the guy that, that uh, replaced Moses after Moses died. And it was Joshua that led them into the land of promise, in the land of Canaan. Under Joshua brought it with them and then took them to the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David. David, David's life comes about a thousand years before the life of Jesus. So an easy way to remember that is Abraham comes about 2,000 years before Jesus. Moses comes about 1,500 years before Jesus. And David comes about 1,000 years before Jesus. Jesus is 2,000 years from our time to kind of help you with the history of it a little bit. 
God drove out before him. It remained in the land until the time of David. So this tabernacle, this, this portable temple, remains in the land until David has, David was the great king. David secured all of the borders. David defeated all of their enemies. He expanded the kingdom. And then you remember at one point, David says, man, I live in this great, t- this, this great palace. I have rest in the land, but, but God has no place to live, and he determines that he's going to make God a great temple. Uh, it says, drove them out of the land and remained in the land until the time of David, who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. So David is in this great time of peace, this time of great prosperity. He wants to build a temple, but what God says, he says, you're not going to build me a house. I don't need you to build me a house. He says, I'm going to build you a house, David. And it's there that God then reiterates the promise that was made to Abraham that through the lineage and through uh, the the people of Israel and through David's David's, uh, uh, children that all the nations of the earth would be blessed and would be a great nation that would expand to the ends of the earth. And that there would never be, that David's house would always have a ruler in it. And again, this is once again a reiteration of the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. But so David says, I want to build this house. But God says, no, you're not going to build it. Your son Solomon is going to build it. We looked at that as well a few a few months ago. But it was Solomon who built the house. Moreover, the most high, this is again Stephen speaking. Moreover, the most high does not live in houses made by men. As the prophet says, this is the prophet Isaiah. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? And, and so what, what Stephen's argument from, from the very beginning is that, yes, you built, me a te- you built God a temple, and God did dwell in that temple. But the temple was never meant to completely contain the presence of God. This was reiterated to, to Solomon by God himself, and it was, it was reiterated later by the prophet Isaiah that even though the temple was so central to their worship, it was never designed. You, a, a building can't house the presence of God. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all things? A quotation from Isaiah. God is saying, I made everything. I don't need you to build me a house. And here's the indictment in verse 51. You stiff-necked people. This is Stephen again speaking. Now, he is speaking to the people that have brought a great accusation, powerful people. It shows the courage of Stephen right up until his death. He had the heart of a lie, and he wasn't afraid to speak what, he, what was truth. He said, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised heart and ears. Now, this is not a unique phrase to Stephen. Moses, right before he, he, he died, he gives this final charge to the people. And if you remember, the history of Moses goes something like this. Uh, he brings the people out of Egypt takes them about a year or so. They spend some time out Mount Sinai you know, where, they're, where they're given the law. They spend a month there. Then they go to the land of promise, but their hearts are rebellious. So they don't enter into the land. Instead, God says, this generation will wander for 40 years in the desert. They wander for 40 years. Mo- uh, uh, Moses leads them through all of that time. And then right before they enter into the land of promise, God forbids Moses to to take the people in because Moses acted in rebellion to him, disobeyed his commandments. And so Joshua was the one that actually led them in. So right before Moses died, he gives this final charge to the people. And what he's saying, he says, circumcise your hearts. Now, I don't think I need to explain circumcision to anybody here. If I need to, go home, look it up on the Internet, and you'll figure it out pretty quick. But the point of circumcision, it was, it was a sign of something deeper. And the sign of something deeper was that, the, that our hearts have been circumcised. The, the foreskin, if you will, of our hearts have been pulled back, and it's, been, and it, and it's, and it's pure. And, it's, and, and this is the part, this is what circumcision symbolized. And, and, and we have to cut off the, the flesh from around our hearts so that it can be pure and, 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 and honest before God. This is what Moses said that circumcision meant. Paul reiterated it in Romans. So this is a common theme for the people of God. It was a physical, it was a physical thing that the people did. 
to their, to their, little, their little infant babies, but it had a deep spiritual meaning. In fact, now, often, uh, uh, we, we, we have a similar kind of thing with baptism. It means that we're, we've been made pure. We've been made clean. We, 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 uh, we identify with the death and the resurrection of, of Christ with his, with, uh, with his sacrifice. And so what Stephen is saying, he says, yeah, you're circumcised physically, but you're not circumcised spiritually. You've remained closed off. You haven't opened your hearts to God. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. You were just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. All of the law, all of the prophets point to the inevitable coming of Jesus Christ, who fulfills the law, who fulfills the prophets. He says, you killed those people that predicted Jesus' coming. And now have you betrayed and murdered him. They say, not even that, as if that was not enough. You actually went on, you took it a step further, and you actually killed Messiah. You actually killed Jesus, the righteous one. And now have you betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law, you, have, uh, you who have received the law that was put into effect through the angels, but have not obeyed it. In other words, God, the law that, the law that was entrusted to them was given to them to reveal Christ but they rejected it. The consequences were severe. The rest of the passage goes on to say how the people are filled with rage and they take him out and they stone him. We're gonna take a little bit of a look at that next week. But it's a powerful indictment brought by Stephen to the leaders of his culture and the leaders of his community. In essence, here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, from the very beginning, You've been making this up along the way. You've been making it up as you go. Even from the very beginning with the sacrifices, just days after God has brought you out of the land of, out of, the land of Egypt and is getting ready to send you on your journey to the land of promise, from the very beginning, you begin to offer idols. Now, what was interesting, there's never this complete and full rejection of God. Every Every Jewish person would understand that. There was never this complete rejection of God, even at Mount Sinai. They were adding to it. They were saying, well, God's good and all, but let's just kind of hedge our bets and make sure that we're kind of, we have some gods along the way just in case Jehovah, Yahweh, misses something. Let's hedge our bets. Let's add a little something to it. Let's form our theology in a way that fits our understanding, our kingdom. They did it with Aaron and with, uh, with, when, when, they, when they made Aaron make the, the golden calf that was a, a, symbolized all of the gods that they worshipped in Egypt. It starts there. They, according to Amos, they did it all the way through their 40 years of, of traveling in the desert before they inherited the land. They brought those things with them with Joshua, even during the times of the tabernacle worship. And then the great temple that was made by, by Solomon, the temple history is interesting. Solomon makes the temple, um, and when, the, when, the, when, the, when the kingdoms are carried away into captivity, the first temple is destroyed. Then during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, the temple is rebuilt. About three, but it takes forever. And about 300 years before Jesus came, the second temple is finally finished. But it's, it's not nearly as beautiful as the first temple. It says that people, that some of the old men that remembered the first temple, it says that they wept. Then to this terrible king, Herod, during the time of Jesus, right before uh, a generation or so before Jesus, he takes that old temple and he makes it even more ornate and even more magnificent than the first temple. But the problem is the presence of God has left. It's just a beautiful building with no power, no authority, and no presence of God. 
and what Stephen is doing, and so that would, that would have been where Stephen was at that time with that temple that Herod had made. And what he's doing is he's walking him through. He says, even at the times when the tabernacle worship, which was supposed to be the place, the whole point of the tabernacle was that the presence of God would be among his people, that he would be among them. The tabernacle becomes the temple, and we remember we read about the great filling of God's presence in that temple in the time of Solomon. But God was very clear from the very beginning, you're not building this tabernacle the way you want to build it, and you're not going to build the temple the way you want to build it either, because you can't contain me. I made the heavens and the earth. I keep them moving forward by just a word from my mouth. You're not going to contain me in your buildings. You're not going to contain me in your laws and your theology. You're not going to contain me in your practices. I'm above all of those things. I'm God. And in the end, if those practices come with an uncircumcised heart, with a heart that's, that's closed and not open to God and is bound up in all the rituals of worship, but is not entering into a relationship in the presence of the Almighty God, it's all just idolatry. And it's deeply offensive to God. And that's what, that's what Stephen's main argument is. From the very beginning, from the sacrifices to, the, to, the, to the, the images that you carried with you as you traveled, to the tabernacle, even to this temple, everything that you've done has been made by your hands. You've taken a religion. You've taken the promises of the Most High God. You've conformed them into your image, and you're lifting up to God and saying, hey, God, look what I made. And God's deeply offended. Now the Jewish leaders, they kill Stephen. Because you know what I've learned? I've been in ministry a long time. I've learned that people really get offended when you point out their idols to them. They get really, really offended. And we might think to ourselves, well, but Pastor Jim, we don't have idols. I don't, we, I don't worship Molech. I don't sacrifice my children to any gods. That seems like a long time ago. We don't do that today, do we? But every any time that we try to compress God into our theology, any time that we try to compress God into our buildings, into our rituals, any time we try to compress God into our ideologies, that's idolatry. Anytime we try to conform God to our image and not be transformed into his image, that's idolatry. And frankly, we do it all the time. We need to guard our heart about it. Every time that the pastor says something that you know is true, but it makes you angry and you didn't want to hear it, and you storm off and you leave the church, nobody would do that here. I know that. I've heard rumors of other churches, but not ours. But every time we hear something and it makes us angry because we don't, and we don't stop to look and say, hey, maybe what that guy's saying or what that gal's saying is true, and I need to allow it to bring conviction in my heart so I can change. But we get angry and we storm off. You know what that is? That's idolatry. Every time we, we listen to worship music or something of that nature and we say, well, I didn't like that. I didn't like that music, or I didn't like the way that, and we don't, we don't ask ourselves, did it bring glory to God? You know, I hear people say this all the time. They say, well, the worship was terrible. And I go, what do you mean by that? Did, did the words not bring glory to God? Were you not encouraged to say some great things to God about how thankful you are, how wonderful he is, or how powerful and mighty and grateful we are as people, all those things? Did you not say those things? Yeah, we said those things, but the music was terrible. Oh, the, you, so the music was terrible. Yes, the music was terrible. Do you know what that is? That's idolatry. Did you know that? And, and churches fight about it all the time. But it's not the content. It's not the truth that's being spoken. It's a style of music that people prefer or they don't prefer. And they dig their heels in and they fight. Again, not here. It's just the rumors I hear about other churches. That's idolatry. Every time, every time we have, and, and we're blessed with the building, we're, we're pretty simple people, and we got this building, and it's kind of old, it needs work, and we're going to fix it up. We're going to do some really cool things with it. I'm super excited about it. 
But every time we put property and buildings before the kingdom of God, that's idolatry. And I, I've been in churches where, where I was, people were told, you can't bring this cup of coffee into this place. Do you know what that is? That's idolatry. Whenever we try to conform God to our image, whenever we try to take the truth of his word and build our kingdom instead of building his kingdom, that's idolatry. It's offensive to God. It was offensive to God then, and it's offensive to God now. And that's what Stephen is saying. He's saying, you've taken the truth of God's word. You've conformed it into your image. You've created idols, and it's deeply offensive to God. That's why God's rejecting you. There's another story that maybe helps us understand it. A Pharisee comes to a teacher of the law. We read about this in Luke. Teacher of the law comes to Jesus. And he's a guy that knows all of the laws. He knows all of the details, all the intricate laws of of Judaism. And he's kind of trying to hang Jesus up on something. And he says, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, what? What does your law say? And the man quotes passages in the Old Testament. He says to love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, there you go. That's the rule. Love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. That means when we get saved, we understand that We're not conforming God to our image. We're conforming to his image. We're not making demands on him. He's making demands on us. We're not figuring out how we'd like to worship God. We're doing everything that we can to understand from his word what is the appropriate ways to worship God. How does God want to be worshiped? Not how do I want to worship him. How does God want to be worshiped? Not how does God serve me and build my kingdom. How do I serve God and build his kingdom? See, because when we get saved, when we, when we sign on the dotted line, as it were, when we, when, we, when we get immersed in the water, we come out new creations, when we join the family of God, God has expectations on us. We need, we need to be reminded of that. Sometimes the Western church forgets that. We like to sort of, we love the idea of eternal life. We love the idea of living forever with Jesus. Yay. We don't like the idea that there's expectations on our lives. And there is. There's an expectation how I'm going to behave. There's an expectation of what I'm going to do. How am I going to serve? How am I going to love other people? How am I going to do everything in my life to learn everything that I can about this God, this Jesus that saved my soul so that I can live my life in bringing honor and glory to him? I, this is maybe a comical way. It's not a checklist, by the way. One of the, one of the <laughs> almost invariably when I talk with new believers, especially when they're young, and, and they're kind of right on that cusp of getting saved, do you know what their, their question is almost every time? Well, do I have to stop smoking weed? <laughs> I mean, it's every time. And, and what I do, I say, look, it's not a checklist. It's not a punch list. What happens when you get saved, you become a new creation. God will work those details out when you learn and you grow and you pursue him with your heart, your soul, and mind and strength. But when, the, but when, when our faith becomes a, ch- a punch list of things that I do or things that I should do, we miss it. But when everything in our life becomes about knowing God, learning how to serve him, learning how to fulfill his mission, and loving the people that he gave his life for, when that becomes our mission, it changes everything. And I'll take it one step further. Jesus told the man, here is your own law. This was written in the law of Moses. Love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the law. Anything less than that, church, anything less than that is idolatry. And it's deeply offensive to God. So we can learn. We can learn from some of these ancient stories that are embedded into our faith and so much a part of who we are as men and women of faith. We can learn from them 
we can grow from them. And most importantly, we can learn what it means to be men and women of faith pursuing God with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength and learn to love our neighbors as ourselves. It cost Stephen his life. And in some sense, it will cost you your life as well. Because we die to self and we become alive in Jesus Christ. And that's the message of Stephen. God bless you all and have a wonderful evening.